Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Ida Millen. I'm a historian of the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic in Ireland and I lecture in history at Carlow College. Hi, my name is Dr. Anne Moore. I'm a senior lecturer in biochemistry in UCC and my research area is vaccines and uh, virus-based vaccines. So Ida, do we want to start and talk about uh, what happened in 1918 in the uh, influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919? What actually happened in Ireland? The influenza pandemic arrived here in, um, I suppose, the society that largely thought that it had infectious disease under control because the numbers of people dying from infectious disease, which were massive each year, about 70,000 people on the island, uh, there were about 70,000 deaths on the island each year and a very large proportion of those were from infectious disease, maybe about 20,000 deaths. So um, the, the, the numbers of deaths for, for dying from infectious disease uh, was falling rapidly and indeed it would have been the lowest year on record for death from infectious disease had it not been for the 1918 flu. So that was the background. Doctors thought that they had infectious disease under control thanks to the, the new science of bacteriology. But of course, the flu wasn't a bacteria, and was it? No, it wasn't. It was, I guess, it's really interesting to see the bacteriological approaches that they took to uh, addressing influenza in 1918 and how they used that to inform their vaccine development efforts. And I guess it is really interesting that the you know similar uh, approaches were were used, but in the blindness of that it was bacteria rather rather than viruses. And I guess what's really um, remarkable for this current pandemic is how quickly they could even have the genetic sequence of the virus so quickly after they um, after the the pandemic uh, broke out in in China. And I guess, the, I suppose overall, does that affect how we, we're we approaching the pandemic and the start of the pandemic? Because there seems to be some similarities between, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have had to put in place now. And was that similar to 1918 as well? The non-pharmaceutical interventions. But maybe just, we might just backtrack for a second there, Anne, because... Um, it really laid waste, the 1918 flu laid waste completely to society at the time, uh, and it's still society as it passed through. So there was a kind of a natural um, lockdown rather than a, a formally imposed lockdown by, by governments, just to set that background before we move forwards. And the other thing was you talking about the sequencing. Well, the sequencing happened so fast now, whereas the, 19, the sequencing of the 1918 uh, virus has only happened in the last decade. Mm -hmm. People have been trying to complete the sequence of it on until now, which shows how for, much far forward science has come and the technology to um, explore uh, diseases has come in that hundred and odd, odd years mm -hmm. since then. Yeah, and some, some of the great breakthroughs that have been made in, in technology have been able to look at genetic sequences and also kind of the background work that's been going on in infectious disease overall monitoring it, but also making vaccines. So there's no way we could have made a vaccine within, like the first one went into clinical trial within something like 60 days after the pandemic being, well, the, the outbreak being recognized in, in China. But it comes from years of research of, of making different vaccine platforms um, based on, you know, in, in Oxford and, and, and uh, Johnson Johnson, very much a, a virus-based, an adenovirus-based approach. And then the... Um, more traditional approaches of using a, a protein and mixing that with an adjuvant. Um, and then finally, the, the new kids on the block are nucleic acid uh, RNA-based uh, vaccines that are being tried now in, in the States and in, in Germany as well. So it's a far cry from the vaccines that were used in, in 1918 and 1919. And some of those were used in Ireland as well, Ida, weren't they? They were trialled in Ireland. Yes, and of course... Um Vaccine development, as you say, was very much in its infancy. Um, there were two main vaccines um, used in Ireland at the time. Uh, one developed in um, 
Trinity College Dublin and the other developed in, in UCD. And Dr. Kathleen Lynn, the famous uh, Republican um, doctor, was a keen uh, user of the UCD vaccine, uh, which she's supposed to have used with great effect in um, uh, amongst the people of Dublin in, in along the East Wall and um, in other places in the city centre at the time and on the people um, who came to her hospital, St. Dalton's, which was then just, she, she just opened to actually deal with um, flu patients. Okay. And do we know, like, the UCD vaccine, where that came from or, you know, how they made it? Or I've never been able to find out what's in the UCD or um, the Trinity vaccine, but I have seen what's in the welcome vaccines and in the various vaccines that were used in, in America. So they would have, they were basically made of bacteria. So they would have things like uh, streptococcus, uh, Micrococcus catarrhalis, I can't pronounce the words, you do it much better than I will. Um, and of course, Pfeiffer's bacillus. And Pfeiffer's bacillus, uh, named after um, Richard Pfeiffer, was um, um, understood to have caused the Russian flu pandemic of the 1890s. So uh, many of the um, vaccines had that in it. What would you think of that? What would have yeah, done? I mean, when I when you were telling me about this before, I was really interested. I was like, but they didn't know what the virus was, so how could they have a vaccine? And it's really interesting that they um, used bacteria. I know there was a big trial in Aldershot as well in the UK, and some in in military barracks in the US as well. Where, as you mentioned, they took uh, sa samples of bacteria from from infected soldiers and cultured it up, as they could do very well in those days on bacterial plates and broths and use those then to inoculate soldiers. And the, I suppose one issue that I want to come back to kind of clinical trials and how they were done in those days, but also they probably, one of the key things with the 1918 uh, viral strain is that it caused such destruction in the lungs and in the body that that then would allow uh, bacterial um, invasion and pneumonia. And, and many people died of pneumonia as well as from, from the actual influenza virus killing them. And the, the idea of taking a local bacteria and growing it up and giving it to people within that area actually probably has some uh, merit to it, even though that's not what they were logically doing. But it, it may have protected some people. And there are some reports of, of um, the death rate going down in some of these military barracks because they gave this vaccine. So then, of course, they believed that the vaccine actually was working to protect against influenza, but it was probably, if it was working, it was protecting against the um, that kind of local bacteria, that local Pfeiffer's bacillus or, or other bacteria that was invading and causing that secondary uh, damage and, and eventual death to, to individuals. And I guess I say it probably or may have, have resulted in, in protection because clinical trials were... Um, poorly run and that wasn't necessarily people's fault in those days it was very much a the idea of using control uh, groups where you gave a placebo or where you gave um you didn't give uh, any uh, active material and to and the whole concept of using statistics to confidently understand if your intervention had had an effect or not were very very much their infancy and I suppose in a pandemic back then where it was, you know, and, and to some extent we see that now where people were, um, uh, there was an emergency need to develop a, a, a vaccine that worked. And it, but not doing that in the, in the auspices of, of a controlled clinical trial, a randomized controlled trial, you don't know if it worked or not. You have no confidence that the that the vaccine or the therapy will work. And the trials that were done back then were were very. It was we made it, we used it. We think people, the number of people went down, and there was no control for gender. There was no control for age. There was no control for whether people had other infections or not before then. And a lot of that has changed since then, in the sense that. Nowadays, and in the last, I suppose, 20, 30 years in particular, and it's constantly developing as well, how we do clinical trials and the ethics behind those trials and also the regulatory guidelines of what is the best way to do a clinical trial. So you need to, be, to, to do a trial that's as unbiased as possible so that the result that you get from it will give you the, um, 
give you an unbiased result. It worked or it didn't work. And this is something, again, in this pandemic, it's, it's, and we saw this in Ebola as well, to do that in the most ethical manner while still maintaining that by unbiased approach, having enough numbers to have that statistical confidence of whether it will work or not, and also um, how well did it work and what are our endpoints? You know, is a, is a three-day decrease in intensive care um, the endpoint that you were looking for? You need to define that up front and, and, and state that. So, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it, it, I suppose it is another thing that we really learned. And it, at the end of the influenza pandemic in 1918, 1919, there was actually quite a bit in the literature, in the medical literature about actually, we do need to have better clinical trials. So if one thing came out of that pandemic, it was the idea that clinical trials need to be blinded and they need to be unbiased and they need to be um, ethically uh, approached. So it, it is. The American History of Medicine journals particularly uh, talk about that now, you know, that, that these studies were done on quite a large scale. Uh, like the one that came out of New York was done on 300,000 people uh, between mm-hmm. the army and people in the uh, utilities because they thought it was important that things like the gas company and the electric company uh, would be kept going. And they had some doctors and GPs in, in it as well. And the same with the one uh, done out of the Mayo Clinic, I think, um, that... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was done on a, quite a massive scale, maybe 300,000, 400,000 people between both tr- trials. Yeah. Um, but there was one thing, and I, I always found curious about this when I was reading about, um, uh, particularly from the Royal Academy of Medicine had a, a, um, in Ireland, had an emergency meeting on the 15th of November 1918, the height of the second wave in, in, in Ireland. And they were talking about vaccination and how they used it. And they talked about using it both prophylactically and as a treatment. So they'd actually give it to people who had the flu at the time. Wow. What would it have done to them? I suppose if they had severe flu, it probably wouldn't do much because like the whole concept of a vaccine is, well, generally for for infectious diseases, for all infectious diseases, you you want to give it um, beforehand and allow the immune, you're educating the immune system to develop and uh, and understand what approach it needs to take if it ever sees that microbe or that virus in the future. I guess there are some concepts now of using a a post-exposure, say, HIV vaccine or a post-exposure even for for other diseases as well. And in cancer as well, the whole concept of using a a vaccine to go in and educate your, your immune system to attack that cancer is also very prevalent at this stage. But I think with something like influenza virus, especially that 1918, 1919 uh, strain that caused, that is very rapid and caused such devastation, a vaccine is probably too little, too late for, for most people. When it comes to influenza, you want to have that memory, edu- you know, your immune response educated beforehand so that you can respond when you when you have that infection. So it is, uh, it's interesting that they use that. I mean, maybe, maybe it did provide some protection against bacterial infection in the future, um, possibly. But if it survived. But could it yeah. have given them a bacterial ev- infection that would have killed them? Well, hopefully they, they were an activated uh, bacteria, which was the, the prevalent, it was the real, the very, very traditional way of making a vaccine. One was to grow up that pathogen and kill it off. And we still use that quite a bit for, for some human vaccines. And if, say, for example, for an activated polio uh, vaccine and also for quite a few veterinary vaccines the easiest way and going back to cox postulates the easiest way is find the microbe if it causes disease and then kill that off and present that to the immune system but of course there's issues with that because um and, and that's an approach that's been taken in china now with the coronavirus with a coronavirus vaccine is to use an activated approach and i suppose one of the key issues with that is who wants to live next door to a manufacturing facility that's growing up thousands of litres of SARS coronavirus 2 to inactivate it to use it as a vaccine. So there's huge biosecurity measures that are required around that kind of technology. Um, and as well as that, sometimes those, inactiv- those inactivated vaccines, they can be better than other vaccines, but they only kind of um, stimulate one part of the immune system, not all aspects of, of T cells uh, and antibodies. So it is, it's an approach, but it's not, uh, it may not be the best approach. But back in 1918, and it was a very common strategy then for vaccines for diphtheria, for, for pertussis, for, um, and for, for flu. Well, 
the bacteria for, for that, that uh, caused pneumonia and flu, it was, it was a good approach. And what, what kind of therapies did they have in 1918, 1919? How did they, I mean, they, we hear now, with like hydroxychloroquine and bleach uh, famously being, being quoted by the US president. But back in 1918, 1919, what approaches did the, did the public take to, to therapies or to prevention using non-vaccine approaches? Well, curiously, um, medicine in particular um, echoed many of the treatments that are, that are going around um, today. Uh, like hydroxychloroquine is a, is, is a malarial or an anti-malarial vaccine, mm -hmm. yes? And they used quinine. Um, yeah. uh, quinine was a very common uh, medicament, was in most tonics, and it was actually used at the time to reduce fevers. Um, they, uh, alcohol was given in copious amounts. Wow. Absolutely copious amounts. And um, I had one account, I've collected a lot of oral histories on it, as you know, and I had one account um, from uh, the Siv family, family, a Jewish family who lived near Leonard's Corner. And uh, Raphael Siv uh, told me that his father's brother was a 15 or 16 year old who caught it and they kept him constantly mildly drunk for the three weeks that he had it on whiskey. And some um, a scientist told me one time that this might have prevented something like like a cytokine storm what do you think of that yeah it's it's possible i think being drunk for three weeks on copious amounts of alcohol yeah, i think your liver is going to be in in trouble i you think said mildly drunk oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, i think yeah it's I, I mean a toxicologist would would probably know more than me um but i mean ethanol would that uh, suppress the immune system to a state where it wouldn't be the first thing you think of to suppress the immune system. I mean, in 1918, though, possibly, possibly. I mean, there probably weren't any steroids or anything back then. So, you know, they're relying on on things like quinine and, and ethanol. I've never heard of ethanol being used, yeah. alcohol being used to suppress an inflammatory response. But, but possibly uh, quinine, you can see the scientific rationale for quinine uh, suppressing the, the immune system. I mean, maybe ethanol, maybe it up regulates um the, the you know kind of uh, anti-inflammatory and steroids and things like that but yeah i mean again it comes back to if they had clinical trials yeah you know arthur griffith was in he was interned under the german plot um uh um affair in in the uk at the time and he swallowed when he got it he was he was one of the oldest in Tunisia, and he didn't want to go down with the flu he wanted to keep you know the men's morale boosted because they were in, in quite you know bad state of mental health quite depressed with this flu raging all around them and uh, you know if it took their leader he reckoned it would have been a pretty bad thing so he swallowed a, a bottle of it and uh, apparently when he was found the morning after doing it of quinine and um, that his eyes were actually sticking out on stalks and um you know it, but he got up and and he played whatever ball they were playing in the yard as a result but they were nearly, nearly as afraid robert brennan said he was nearly as afraid that um he would die of the cure as of the disease but then yeah. the other great cure doctors had at the time was calomel which is mercurous chloride Okay. And that was a great staple of the doctor's bag, bag mainly so it was an apparent, you know, to open open the, the bowels. So mm -hmm. I suppose if you have a really sick patient who's too sick to move out of the bed, they suddenly have to get out of bed to go to the, you know, yeah. pot, the pot. Yeah. But it seems to have stimulated them in, so, in some way. Strychnine was used. Wow. And yeah. we, our generation thinks of strychnine as being James Bond's uh, would-be assassin's poison of choice rather than something that you use as a cure. But strychnine was quite widely used at the time as a stimulant. And I think it's actually still in some medicines today. Yeah. Um, what, did, what did strychnine do? I, I, I think it kind of gave this kind of, it was supposed to be a stimulant, so it gave this kind of jerky effect. I'm not oh. sure. And uh, I can't find much uh, evidence of what it actually did, but the, the, the medical literature just says it acted as a stimulant. And they gave it particularly in areas around the country in the dispensaries where, uh, say, Lisbon, for example, where the local guardians didn't approve of the use of alcohol. But alcohol was really widely used, and particularly in hospitals, the Matter Hospital, the older doctors, um, from an account we have from, from uh, McNamara, D.W. McNamara, uh, says that the older doctors used it in abundance that they said it wouldn't cure the patients, but at least it sent them on a merry dance to the hereafter. <laughs> 
Jeez. And would, would those yeah. drugs be easily available? Strychnine, you said they had to go to the dispensary, and I presume yeah. alcohol was very, very prevalent. But how do people easily access medical care and drugs or...? relatively easily we had uh, the poor law dispensary system here at the time and um, you know each market town had its poor law union and then each smaller town would have its dispensary so there would be doctors there about 70 percent of the population was under the care of the poor law that got free medicine and um, the, the the issue they would have had during the pandemic was actually just getting supplies of the medicine. So you see constantly throughout the literature in the hospitals and uh, the dispensaries that they're telephoning rather than um, writing for their medicines to try and get them quicker. And I know in the Dublin dispensaries, they employed extra um, pharmacists to make up the drugs. And then you see the constant tales around the country as well of uh, pharmacists working around the clock. I have some really good mm-hmm. accounts of that. And if anybody listening has more accounts, I'd, I'd love more of them. Uh, you know, particularly of making things like cough uh, bottles up in Jeroboam's and big, huge bottles rather than in small ones. And uh, they also used quite very commonly, and again, I've had um, interviewees have told me about this happening to them as a small child. Um, they used poultices made with linseed and they'd put them on their chests. And apparently that was a very common treatment at the time. Um, I'm going to think there was uh, creosote was also used as a gargle, a tincture of creosote. Wow. Soon the throat will go away. I suppose the whole concept of drug shortages is something that we are seeing a little bit here in for, for SARS-2 mm. as well, where remdesivir is at an absolute shortage globally, at least. And I know the, the NHS had stockpiled dexamethasone before the release of that result of their, of their clinical trial. And it's going to be... A, it is already a big concern if there is a vaccine and how does the world come together to to make sure that there is some stockpiles or how we, we distribute the vaccine to, to start with. So some things don't change, do they? And I suppose we did learn from it, but we, um, yeah, we're, we're still not great at I think handling. the biggest thing we always have to learn from these is we need slack in the system. We don't because the hospitals were totally overrun in 1918. They were mm. also suffering from crises of of um, personnel because so many people were away at the war and they were suffering from costs and inflation uh, they were suffering from, from things like coal shortages um, so there's yeah. so many of these things that are echoed today in the current crisis is that we have to learn not to just focus on budgets but to build it in slack into our systems Definitely. so that we can cope in crises like this yeah absolutely absolutely hopefully that will be a lesson that we all learn from it that there is that there is a, a buffer in the system and were the public health, was there, there, there was an organised public health, but I presume it was quite different to what we have now. Or was it just the, the health system overall? It was very doctor centred uh, the, 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 because there was 70% of the population under the poor law uh, could get treatment under the p- poor law in Ireland. Um, uh, so that meant, you know, that they really had access to a doctor for either a home visit or a visit to a dispensary. Um, so um, the actual system uh, was so overrun by the, by the flu um, there was a report done um, a study done on the health system um, by the Irish Public Health Council and that reported back um, the following year and while it didn't actually mention the flu crisis um, it's written into every line you know, wow. you can see it in that it calls for more uh, bacterial laboratories, as they call them, to yeah. be established so that they could come to, uh, you know, a scientific understanding of what had happened. Mm-hmm. And for greater connectivity between the hospital system, uh, for more beds in hospitals, you know, the hospitals were so overrun uh, that places like Dublin um uh, South Dublin Union Hospital, which is now St. James's, you know, they would have um, been making parts of the workhouse into um, into hospital wards at the time. And the same thing happened in workhouses throughout the country and also in hospitals. D.W. McNamara talks about uh, the matter uh, giving all bar one female and one medical ward over to flu pa- patients. And did it make a difference after that when that report came out? Do we have any hope that, because we're probably going to have these reports after 
Not really, because we very quickly were then into the changing dispensation with the revolution and the new nation. So some of the, the ideas that came up in it were, were introduced in the mid-1920s, but some took another 30 years to introduce. But interestingly, um, in other parts of the world, the idea of socialised medicine gained much more foothold after this uh, mm-hmm. because they saw the need for it, that, that, that health for the poor as well as for the wealthy as a way to making safer societies overall. And it would have been part of the thinking behind the foundation of the NHS as well. So maybe that is something that we can take from, from 1918 and hope that we can develop after this crisis, this coronavirus crisis. Yeah, one thing I always think of, you know, we think we're never going to forget this crisis now and that we're going to learn from the lessons of the present and the past to apply to the future whenever the next pandemic comes. Uh, But Charles Rosenberg, the great historian of um, disease, he writes that all pandemics end with a fizzle. And like, well, we long for the fizzle when suddenly something else moves to the top of the news agenda. It's also really important that we look at these lessons and don't just all shove it under a carpet and try to move on quickly. Yeah. Need to. Which is something that happened in 1918-19, wasn't it? it mm. It's kind of called the forgotten pandemic, I think. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because that- just over. One of my witnesses, uh, uh, Tommy Christian, um, uh, a guy who um, had a very deep philosophy about it and thought a lot about it, I interviewed him three or four times, and he said, look, it kept coming back and back. That's why we didn't want to talk about it. We just wanted to shut the door on it and hope that the next time it wouldn't come back again. Wow. Okay. Okay. So the the waves of influenza and the death kept coming back. Mm. Because there was three waves in Ireland and in most parts of the world. Okay. Australia, curiously, which was the only place that tried any really effective form of quarantine. It kept people in ships before they came into Australia, before they landed, mm. had only yeah. one uh, wave of it. Yeah. And San Francisco, if I remember rightly, had pretty good public health control as well to try and... Mm. Public health was much more developed in, in in parts of America than it was. They were really leading the public health charge at the at the time, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So, have changed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I suppose then, like when you know, today we're very much concerned as well about misinformation and mistrust and uh, of um, healthcare and of society in general. Was it similar to that in 1918 or like how, how was it politicized? Was it, well, to some extent, I, I heard you mentioning before that it was used that, that the influenza pandemic was used by Sinn Féin um, for their political kind of messages. Is that right? Or? Oh, absolutely, because so many of the internees, the Sinn Féin internees were, were in hospital. And of course, the December 1918 general election was looming and uh, they really used it well to say, look, if any prisoner dies in hospital, they'll be held to pay. Uh, because some were formally um, charged and others were just interned at the time under the Defence of the Realm Act uh, regulations. So, um they used it very much at the time, but it was also used. There was so much myth going on. Um, one of the myths that went around was that aspirin, which was used, but not as widely as you would think at the time, but it was made by Bayer. And Bayer, of course, was a German company. And the myth went around, particularly in America, that that's how the flu was being spread through the boxes of aspirin. Yeah. And it's something that happens quite a lot, both with, uh, for some medical um conditions but also very much these days with vaccines this uh misinformation and um sentiment that that kind of i mean even with um polio vaccines i mean one of the reasons that we haven't eradicated finally eradicated polio from the planet we've almost eliminated is these uh false stories that um you know it's a western plot that you know giving your child a, a polio vaccine is a western plot that you know you're actually giving them disease or you know, there's some sort of, um, it's going against your religion. And, you know, that's one of the key things that we're really battling with in, in vaccines these days is, is to try and address this misinformation um, of what a vaccine actually does. And I guess that really comes back to the heart of, of society as well. I mean, misinformation can, can spread really easily as well, you know, based on on um Poor, poor levels of education. So again, we, we have to address that as, as a society. And, and, and yeah, think I think the other thing we really need to focus on is the trust, trust that yeah. trust is key and that governments, institutions, drug companies, whoever, and medicine and the people all need, um, they all need to be open with the people. 
and to trust them as as as, as much as 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 um, you know, so that that trust builds and yeah. that the misinformation can't take hold. Yeah, but and really, think you're trying to hide something from you. They think you're trying to hide something else from you. Yeah, and, and I think yeah, yeah it, it is really important that me as a scientist and and you know all scientists um, are better able at communicating. Um, you know what you know, different results that we see coming out in clinical trials, both for drugs and for vaccines actually means and what normally happens in these processes, as well as kind of the, you know, from, from you know, the, the medical approach, their ability to communicate and, you know, what are the, how can they most effectively communicate with their patients when it comes to vaccines um, and how that, you know, to, to really enforce the, the uh, or re, reinforce the idea that these are incredibly safe vaccines that, you know, there's risk associated with any medical intervention. And we know from our research that, that the, um, the most trusted person in Ireland when it comes to vaccines are the GPs. Um, and people listen to their GPs and they listen to their healthcare providers. So that if, you know, in the environment, you know, nurses and doctors and dentists and pharmacists are signing up to flu vaccines and to other vaccines, then there is more of a, a possibility that... Um, uh, the general public will come on board as well and but uh, so we do healthcare professionals as you know need to to understand the best way of of disseminating a message and it's really important that we get them on board for vaccination as well as the general public i think a bigger issue is how how the general public you know their understanding in ireland is is assisted in in understanding what's happening with this current pandemic and the, the, I suppose the media has a, has a role to play in that as well. I think one of the things that's happened maybe and with um, vaccination hesitancy in general is that until this big jolt that we're getting now people had really forgotten about the impact that infectious disease has on individual lives mm-hmm. and you know how my generation I suppose I admitted freely I was born in 1960 and I was part of that lucky generation that still got the infectious disease, but could take advantage of antibiotics to cure them. Whereas my daughter's generation get the vaccination and they will never see the disease. So therefore their generation doesn't know the damage that these diseases did. So I think it's really important to get stories of those diseases out there so people know them. And I think the same thing um, happens now with, um, you know, you hear so many people saying, oh, I don't know anybody who actually has coronavirus. Well, I do. And I can tell you when you know listen to people, nurses who've had long COVID and listen to the damage that they have and confidence in their own health going forwards. It's such a frightener. That's nearly more frightening than death in some ways. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that we see always with vaccines. Vaccines are a victim of their own success because if a vaccine is working, you don't see disease. And straight away people, and we've had many uh, events and talked to many people as part of our our vaccine hesitancy research and people will say, but sure that disease isn't around. So why, why should I have a, a needle stuck into me uh, to protect me from a disease that doesn't exist? But I think what people forget sometimes is that a lot of these diseases are still in our environment. And the only way we can protect against it is by building the defense in the community overall of having a vaccinated community and generate, dare I say, herd immunity, <laughs> which is being a term that's been completely misused so many places now. But, you know, it really is about, it's the same as building a dam to prevent the water getting in. We have to build community protection against all these diseases. Some we can eradicate. There is no reason why we can't eradicate things like measles and polio from the planet. Other diseases like Pertussis and, uh, well, maybe not pertussis, but um, diphtheria and tetanus are definitely going to to always be in the environment. And I think it is, you know, uh, this is going to happen with the coronavirus vaccine as well. People are going to say, but sure, it's not around. And as you say, oh, sure, I don't know anybody with it, but it it will happen. And we do need to preempt this this conversation of, well, why are people going to be hesitant and what information do they need? to uh, accept a, a vaccine and I guess then it's who is going to be vaccinated and you know at the moment it's going to be healthcare workers that uh, are going to be the first line to, to, to more than likely be vaccinated and hopefully they will be very accepting of that vaccine and then it's going to trickle down to, to the, the vulnerable and the frontline workers and there again even with vulnerable 
vulnerable people. I kind of worry that a vaccine that isn't less than, you know, 80, 90 percent efficacious is going to is actually going to work in the vulnerable and the elderly and people. Maybe some people with comorbidities, but the elderly, we always have a problem with vaccines working in the elderly. So it's going to be a very interesting time. I don't think a vaccine is going to cure our is going to end this pandemic, you know, tomorrow or you know as suddenly it, it is going to trickle on for a little while even with all the vaccines that we will have hopefully and the uh, the drugs that we will have as well maybe to finish on i'm just wondering two questions for you one is how close do you think we are to a vaccine and the other how long do you think that vaccine will last yeah great questions yeah i mean i think probably neither of which you can answer <laughs> but, but in your best guess <laughs> I guess a vaccine, like the, it is the, the speed and the amount of funding that's gone in to, um, to clinical trials. And I think people are, people have a question of kind of, oh, they're going very fast. It means that, you know, we won't know about safety. But the reason they're going fast is because we're doing so much in parallel. And that's, that has never happened for vaccines before. Looking at the safety in those clinical trials will take as long as it takes and looking at the efficacy of those trials. And Pfizer and BioNTech are saying that they'll have preliminary results um, at the end of this month, at the end of October. Mm. And again, it's, we're at the mercy of nature as to whether the infection rate has been high enough across uh, across their clinical trial sites to see if it's worked or not. So hopefully, I mean, we might know by the end of the year as to whether um, we have a vaccine that's looking promising. We should have enough bulked up. Hopefully, there's a lot of people working very hard to have that uh, uh, rolled out there'll be small amounts available at the start when it comes to Ireland it's difficult to say we've all joined up to the Ireland's joined up to this EU coordinated effort if we had a vaccine available in Ireland next summer it would be fantastic it would be really great and if we could get our healthcare workers uh, as a first line vaccinated before next uh, autumn would be would be a fantastic result but it doesn't mean that the virus is going to go away in the community uh, you know, with any infectious disease, I don't know. Polio was a great example, actually, back in the 1950s, where it was a really successful vaccine came in. But the, the virus still trickled away in the community for some time. So we are going to have to go from our, our healthcare workers and, pop, and vaccinate the whole population. And that's going to take time. It's going to take a few years to do that. Maybe it's going to be similar to what happened with polio back in the 1950s in Ireland. But as we can see now, polio is a disease of the past in in um, in Ireland. But it, it it's not a disease of the past in the sense that the, the virus still exists in the world, and we need to we can eradicate it. Once we can eradicate it, nobody's going to need polio vaccination. But there are these pockets in Afghanistan and Nigeria and one or two other places. And until we get rid of those, we have to keep vaccinating against against polio. And it's going to be the same with coronavirus. So it kind of comes back to local effort, but a global a global uh, effort to, to really get rid of it overall in the world. Oh, so maybe maybe on that note, that's kind of a, a very uh, aspirational uh, view of of uh, of where we could go with vaccines. But I think you know it is going to take time for for a vaccine to have an effect, even in an Irish community. Um, and hopefully we'll get it here as soon as we can. Hopefully we will have a vaccine. We definitely have enough being tried at the moment across different sort, different vaccine technologies that hopefully at least one will work. And hopefully I, I th I'm hopeful that at least three or four of them should have some promise and provide some protection against against coronavirus. It's fascinating. And I'm so excited when I get the chance to talk to you as a scientist and to explain things that I'm looking at in my past that I don't have the scientific in the history that I look at, the kind of historical understand, I, the, the, the scientific knowledge to understand. So it's brilliant, you know, the, the kind of perspectives that you bring to me and to what I can add, then add in back to my work. And long may science and humanities talk to each other. Yes, because it's the same for me. I think the the understanding I've got from talking to you guys over between flu and just what happened in Ireland and people's reactions to it. I think it's really, really important that, that science and humanities, humanities and medicine have this, be, you know, have a really open conversation because we can learn so much from each other about it because scientists traditionally were very focused, stuck in a lab. We come up with a cure. 
we'll put it in a vial and then of course everybody will accept it. So it's really important that we keep this conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ida.